Well, welcome to the Nathan Meyer series in Bible exposition. Uh, by now, you're well acquainted with our speaker, Dr. Ron Allen. Uh, if you've been here this week, you know about his extensive writing ministry and his speaking engagements worldwide. But I'd like to in introduce him as a special professor of mine, one who's been quite influential in my life, a wonderful colleague for a number of years, and a great friend. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Allen as he comes to speak to us today. Well, I am ready today. <laughs> Actually, I'm not. When uh, I was in seminary in the THM program, I had the wonderful pleasure of being the assistant for our great professor of homiletics at the time, and uh, one of the most influential people in my life, Haddon Robinson. In fact, we have a son who is Craig Haddon uh, Allen, and uh, so he was very influential in my life. And I handled his correspondence and his booking uh, for his extensive preaching ministry, and one day when I was in my fourth year, and I'd been working for him for three years, I said, uh, Dr. Robinson, I see that over the years I've seen that you have uh, a pattern in your preaching that when you go to a church for the very first time, you give your signature sermon, which was uh, wonderful, and it's the, it, it's the, it's the powerful uh, story uh, of a woman uh, who needs uh, help. And then I said, um, you do other sermons fairly frequently, but I just had a thought today, and I went through file drawers, and I don't think once you've ever spoken from John chapter 3, John 3, 16. And he laughed, and he said, well, when I was a kid preacher in the streets of New York, you see my ear? Uh, he had a cauliflower ear from gang fights. Um, he said, um, I preached on John 3.16 on the street corners when I was a kid. But then I came to seminary, and I've been preaching uh, for years. But I don't think I'm ready to preach from John 3.16 until I'm 80. So I am 81, <laughs> and I'm going to speak from Psalm 23, because there's a bit of correspondence there in familiarity from one uh, testament to the other. Psalm uh, 23, I'm talking about favorite psalms. Psalm 23 is probably uh, the uh, dearest, dearest loved psalms among God's people, um, and, and probably in your life as well. Psalm 23 is just an extraordinarily beautiful psalm. Um, I'm going to say that uh, my response to this psalm is very personal uh, today. And uh, if Yahweh is the shepherd of David and is the shepherd of believers, uh, my prayer for myself today is, O oh, Yahweh, shepherd me now. Now, the imagery of the psalm is uh, exquisite because it was a part of the daily life of so many people in uh, uh, the Iron Age in Israel. Shepherding of uh, sheep and goats, they were kept together, was just a regular part of daily life. One was either a farmer uh, or a herdsman. And uh, when, when we read in Deuteronomy that the land that God was giving to the Hebrew people as they left Egypt, um, it was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And the milk doesn't refer to cows, it refers to goats because um, uh, cattle take too much room and too much feed, and goats produce wonderful milk. I know we raised dairy goats on our little hobby farm in Oregon for 20 years. <laughs> and sheep give, um, uh, give wool, and uh, they both give meat. So uh, the husbanding of animals was a very big part of the life of the Hebrew people. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, and the honey refers to agriculture because honey is the product of bees, and that means that the land will be sufficient for herdsmen and for farmers. 
So this was just a big part of uh, being a Jewish person under the care of God in uh, early Bible times. So the, it's, it's a major theme. In this psalm, um, I'm using lots of chutzpah uh, in this series because I just casually say it's a psalm of David. And I said of Psalm 110 yesterday, this is a psalm of David. I may be one of the last Hebrew professors on the planet that believes those things <laughs> because the current view is that David can't be attributed with uh, credibility of writing any of the Psalms. Um, there's a great um, a dismissal of that. In fact, once at an ETS meeting, uh, I was giving a paper, and in the first paragraph I said, now in this Davidic Psalm, and several professors got up and walked out of the room, <laughs> why well, sit and for an hour and listen to a dolt who still thinks David wrote a psalm that's in the Bible. Um, you have to take my course to know why I believe this is true. <laughs> so it's a little bit of chutzpah. You know what chutzpah is? It's not a Bible word, it's a Yiddish word. Chutzpah, according to my dictionary of Yiddish language, <laughs> really, <laughs> chutzpah is that quality in a person who having murdered his parents, says to the judge, have mercy, your honor, I'm an orphan. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that's chutzpah. And just to blithely say this is a Psalm of David, to me, this is really important. But uh, here's another thing I've said, that in the Psalms um, and in other parts of Hebrew Bible, we have uh, promises and expectations of life after death resurrection of the body, and heaven. And um, fewer people believe that the Old Testament speaks of life after death than believe uh, David wrote the, some of the Psalms. I mean, this is really a passe thing. And here I am just up here standing and saying, that's what I believe. So I want you to know I'm aware that um, these are not the popular views today. But I think it's essential to know that Psalm 23 is written by David because it, it molds his life in our recognition of him. And as I said, this is perhaps the most loved psalm. Psalm 113 is a psalm dearly loved by Jewish people because of its use in Passover Seder. And uh, Psalm 110 had to have been a favorite church, a uh, psalm in the early church, because it's quoted more than any other psalm in the pages of the New Testament. And then, uh, this is a psalm of trust. Um, people who wrote on the psalms in the 19th century and before knew that in the psalms there were beautiful poems and, um, and some poem, poems with a lot of angst and um, a lot of distress. But no one had really figured out the forms of the psalms uh, until um, a German scholar in the early decades of the 20th century figured things out. And his name was Gunkel, Hermann Gunkel. Uh, by the way, there's a quiz at the end of today, and uh, you write that name down. His book was published posthumously in um, 1933. And it was on uh, praise and lament in the Psalms, followed by a book at mid-century that clarified and developed things more. And um, uh, this, this book was called, similarly, Praise in the Psalms by Klaus Westermann. And uh, Gunkel figured out the master plan for the writing of Psalms in terms of form and shape and content. Because it turns out that there is such a thing and the reason it took a long time for someone to figure it out, Gunkel uh, understood, is that the psalmist had this master plan in mind, but they didn't use all the elements all the time. In fact, rarely are all the elements in one psalm because they had freedom to have this platform that they could select items from and then craft their psalm. So here's the master plan. 
Uh, there's a quiz. There's the introductory cry. This is a psalm of lament. There's the introductory cry when the psalmist who's a believer in God, one who expects much from God, one who is trusting in God and finds something goes so horribly wrong they cannot believe it. And the response of a person like that is the response that you've had the number, numerous times in your life. Oh, my God. And that's not the oh my God of a tweet or a, a, a gal saying to other guys, oh my God, do you see what she's wearing today? It's not that. No, this is a deep disappointment that you expect better because you trust in God. And something awful has happened. Your house has been driven by the forces of a, uh, of a hurricane, driven off its foundation, and you barely escaped with your life, but your daughter died. And you trust in God. And you, the parents, are the survivors. And you've lost a daughter just the other day. Oh, my God. This is not trivial. This is the scream of a broken heart. And that's how these psalms begin. And then uh, the psalmist feels free enough with God because he or she is so trusting in God that they're able to express their deep feelings about God in this hurt. And they use three pronouns. I'm hurting, and you don't care, and they are winning. I'm hurting, and God, if you cared, it wouldn't have happened. So obviously you're disinterested. And they actually say that in the song. And they, the enemies, whatever the enemies are, clearly they're in charge. And these are profound statements. In the 80s, I was productive in writing, and I was at what then was called the Christian Booksellers Convention in Dallas, Texas, coming from Portland, Oregon. It was a big deal. And my publisher uh, was also the publisher of a person you may have heard about at Dallas Seminary, Chuck, Chuck um, Sw Swindoll, that's it. <laughs> So they set up a table for me, and my book was on display, and we were in a, a large room, and there were uh, food areas all around, and, and uh, public wasn't invited to this, but uh, owners and sellers of books from all over the country were there. And there were hundreds of, literally hundreds of people waiting in line just to see me and to have me sign my book. It didn't matter that the desk behind me was Chuck Swindoll, but I'm pretty sure they were there just to hear me. <laughs> and uh, I had just come back from Israel. I flew from, from Israel to, to Dallas, and I had a brand new shofar, a big one, a kudu a horn, and it, it stands about this high, and it has these wonderful curls in it. And every once in a while when there was a pause, I'd blow my chauffeur, because I'm celebrating me. This is a big deal. <laughs> and uh, I'm blowing, and then Swindoll says, there's Ron. He's always blowing his own horn. <laughs> it was one of the most enjoyable days as a writer in my life. And then it was ruined when during a break, Don Wurtson, who is a graduate of our school and a phenomenal pianist, and uh, a magnificent uh, uh, writer of music, composer, and uh, a lover of the Psalms. And he came in and he said, Ron, uh, I've been asked by, and he named someone, I'll not tell you his name, a very wonderful a writer, but he says, I've been asked by him to come and talk to you because he's too mad at you to talk to you himself. He's afraid he'll really get angry. And he wants you to stop writing books on the Psalms. And I said, what? He said, the Psalms are sub-Christian. The Psalms do not 
build affirming lives. The Psalms speak against God. Tell Alan that if he doesn't stop writing on the Psalms, I'm going to start writing about him and it won't be pleasant. And my day of blowing the horn and <laughs> pretending all those people were there for me, that just, just all crumbled. And Don and I talked about it a lot uh, over the years. Um, he couldn't take the idea that in the Psalms someone can point their finger to heaven and say, you don't care. But the point is, that's how you'll feel sometime, if you haven't already. And the Psalms, in my view, give us the opportunity to express that hurt. But that is always, those are the, um, those are the lament uh, pronouns, but that is always followed by a confession of trust. So in Psalm 13, David says, Will you forget me, O Lord, forever? And uh, you hear that pain? And then he says, But I trust in your loyal love. And that's his confession of faith, of trust. Because this is not just anyone who's hurting. This is a believer who's hurting. And a believer who's hurting stays a believer. Amen. We have a daughter who nearly died of leukemia, and my wife and I joined a group of parents in a, a support group called Candlelighters for Children. And over several years, we got to be friends with other parents with children with uh, terminal cancer. And uh, one boy, I'll never forget, um, procedures uh, were not uh, working. And the last, the last hope was a bone marrow transplant. And in Portland, you go to Seattle for that. In Dallas, you go to Houston. Very few hospitals are prepared to do all this. And um, uh, so I would go up to Seattle about every three weeks, and I'd spend time with the parents. They were a wonderful young Christian uh, couple. The fellow was a truck driver and had come to faith in Christ at a truck stop Bible study. Imagine that. <laughs> and um, anyway, he was a young believer, but um, he had rough background. And he was going through phoresis. There was one needle in this arm, one needle in this arm. His, his arms were tied down, strapped down to this big chair. And he was to be there for three hours as all of his blood is circulated uh, into a centrifuge and the blood product that was needed for his uh, boy uh, was provided by him. He became a donor for his son. And he's in this room alone and there's a charge nurse in there. And when I came in, he was swearing like a sailor. I mean, he was so upset and God, God this and God that and, and he was so angry. And uh, here's a guy who's a truck driver. He's fathered children probably in three or four places in the country, he doesn't even know it. And here, uh, my wife and I, we, we long for a child, and now God gave us this child, and now our child is dying. And he'd swear some more. And this nurse came up to me when she saw me. She says, will you please calm this person down? And I said, no, don't think I will. <laughs> and she got mad at me, and she stormed out. And I sat down beside him. I said, how much time do you have? Two more hours? Yeah. I said, well, go on with what you're doing. And he was angry some more at God. Finally, he'd worn himself out. And I said, uh, we still have over an hour. You know, you told me how you came to Christ when we first met, but I don't remember all the details. Would you mind telling me that again? He says, what? I said, well, now just tell me how you came to faith. And he said, well, all right. So he starts telling me how he came to love Jesus. And this nurse came in, and she heard him, and she said, oh my God, <laughs> in disgust. And when he left, she stopped me, and she says, 
what in the world is going on with this man? They said, he's the father of a beloved child who is going to die. And he knows it. And he loves Jesus. And he's divided between his pain and anger at what he feels is something really wrong and his abiding new love for Christ. We call that a hurting believer. She says, well, I never. So, well, we can talk. <laughs> so there's this trust. And then comes the petition. And it's the reversal of the hurt. The pronouns are now uh, answered by verbs. You don't care. He says, hear me. Um, I'm hurting. Save me. They're winning. Punish them. So the verbs hear, save, punish match the pronouns I, you, and they. And then there's a vow. Oh, Lord, when I've gotten through this, I will praise your name. So that's the master plan. And from that master plan, you can take the praise element and have a praise psalm that stands by itself. And you can take the trust element, and instead of it being a phrase or a line, it can be an entire psalm. And I say that because I've had a serious conversation with more than one scholar uh, in my life who said, I do not like Psalm 23. Things are too pretty and too easy in that psalm, and life isn't like that. And I've explained it's a part of the larger index. And look closely at the psalm. He's talking about enemies, and he's talking about dark terrors. But he's now focusing on his trust in God. So that means that this comes from the master plan, and yet it's just extraordinary. Now, in my view, this psalm is all about shepherd and sheep. Most people today say that it has two movements, and the first is about shepherd and sheep, and the second is about host and banquet. My view is that this is a poem, and poets are able to use language in unusual ways. I had a wonderful professor of poetry in my university days who said, the biggest thing about reading a poem is not to start off asking the question, what does this poem mean? Far more important is to ask, how does this poem mean? Because you see, if it's just meaning that you're after, it's a lot easier, more easily done in prose. You can be clearer, and um, you, can, you, know, you can give directions for how to uh, work on your car engine in prose. You wouldn't want to do that in poetry, would you? <laughs> but when it comes to emotion and feeling, uh, it, it, poetry is such a wonderful medium. And the how the poem means is perhaps more important than what the poem means. And there's a development of a single theme of the first verse. And the verse is, Yahweh is my shepherd. I do not want. Um, there's a development of this throughout. Uh, David has no fear because Yahweh is his shepherd. And David is presented two ways in this psalm. On the one hand, uh, he is the sheep whose shepherd is the Lord. But on the other, as king, I believe this was written after he was a king, and he's looking back at shepherd days. Uh, he is uh, he's the king, so the nation are his flock members. And uh, they are the ones for whom he's responsible, as a shepherd is responsible for the sheep. So it goes both directions. And, uh, and it's also a royal psalm. And while the word king isn't used in the psalm, he's using the psalm to model what true kingship should be. And one of the most common images of kingship in the ancient Near East is that of shepherd. So two movements, verses 1 to 4, Lord is shepherd, caring for the psalmist's every need. And uh, ascription is the Lord 
extending his chesed to his sheep. If the word chesed is new to you, I'd like you to learn how to say it. It's the word translated mercy, kindness. Um, I was learned to uh, translate it as loyal love. So the H is a rough H. Ch, uh, hate. Chesed. Can you say that? Chesed. So I'm wearing a shirt today that uh, has a famous painting. Uh, some of you recognize it. Others are thinking, what's that? <laughs> anyway, this is Starry Night, um, painted by a great Dutch painter, a post, um, uh, uh, let's see, what am I trying to say? Um, anyway, a uh, post-impressionist painter, uh, 1898, and his name is Vincent, not Van Gogh, that's English, not uh, American English, not Van Gogh, that's British English, the G is pronounced in the Netherlands as a, a rough H, just like hate. Hoch. Van Hoch. Did you hear that? Bev and I have been at the Van Hoch Museum in Amsterdam, and we learned there how to say his name. And I'm making a big deal of this, so you can say Hoch, you can say Chesed. <laughs> it's the same sound though completely unrelated. <laughs> so, and the psalm speaks prophetically of Jesus, and I say that without apology. Jesus is the good shepherd. I was in a group of discussion of Jewish scholars and rabbis and um, evangelicals who could read Hebrew for about 10 years in Portland, and we got to be such close friends, these Jewish Rabbi, well, every rabbi is Jewish, but the rabbis and their Jewish friends, and we Christians, that there came a point when Rabbi Yona Geller and I, who were the co-chairs of this discussion, uh, we would plan in June what our topic would be for the next school year in our monthly discussions. And he said, Ron, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but... Uh, one of the other rabbis suggested that since we've been in Hebrew Bible all these years, maybe we should read from your Bible. And I choked on the coffee I was drinking. In fact, I spat some out on the white tablecloth in this nice restaurant. I said, really? I would never have suggested that, but it came from them. So believe it or not, in the library, of Congregation Sha'ari Torah, the Orthodox synagogue in Portland, Oregon, we studied the Gospel of John through the school year. It was amazing. And we, we had a deal, you have to read the passage before you come and talk, ask questions. But one of the rabbis refused to take the Gideon Bible I gave him <laughs> home because he didn't want his wife to see it. So he was never prepared. And this day he says, I, I know I'm supposed to be prepared, but I'm not prepared, but I want to read today anyway. And he says, what's the passage? And uh, I opened the Bible for him so he could find uh, John chapter 10. And uh, he turned there. He's never seen these words before. And he's, read he's a good reader. He says, most assuredly I say to you, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever come before me are thieves and robbers. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved. Uh, he got through that somehow. Then he got to verse 11, where, he's, where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And he saw that, and he threw this Bible on the floor, and he spat on it, and he stepped on it, and he swore about it, and he said, that Galilean is claiming to be God. I'll never forget that. And I'm furiously writing what I'm hearing. <laughs> and he says, what are you doing? I said, I, I'm, um, I, I, I'm, I, I'm recording what you're saying because you have the authentic response that must have happened when Jesus was speaking, because they knew 
Psalm 23, and countless other passages that speak of God as shepherd, and that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he says, I am the good shepherd. So this is just so wonderful. So we turn to the psalm, uh, finally. Yahweh is my shepherd, uh, I do not want. Um, that's what the, the poem is all about. Uh, I believe that's the controlling thing through the entire psalm. Um, um, Adonai roi lo echsar. Um, uh, my shepherd is God, and it's the God of the universe, and, and he has, a, in his stooping glory, from the highest heavens, he's come down into my life, and his care for me is as um, uh, tailored as my care was for sheep when I was a shepherd. Yahweh, my shepherd, I do not want. We come to the next verse. By the way, the music this week has been so appropriate. Um, you had the list of what I was going to speak on, and usually, uh, okay, but um, you've incorporated the music um, into every service day, and I thought that was so, so wonderful. So, uh, the, the, the next verse, uh, in um, verdant valleys, he causes me to lie down. Now, a, a shepherd uh, in Judah knows that uh, lots of green grass is pretty sparse after June and July. I go in March. This March, um, the mountains of Judah were just so green and so lush and so many wildflowers. Um, a lady that I work with on these tours, uh, she said, Ron, have you ever seen it this beautiful? I said, no. And she said, in Beersheba, um, it's, it's even, uh, even lusher than here, which is just astonishing. So when it's spring, there's a lot of grasses. But uh, in the other months, uh, not so much. And so sheep learn that if there's a lot of grass, they want to eat a lot because who knows what tomorrow will bring. And, uh, but the provision of this shepherd, whose name is Yahweh, is so wonderful that he causes still-chewing sheep to lie down and um, to begin uh, their um, rumination because there will be grass tomorrow. And the quiet waters, sheep are terrified of fast-flowing streams. They fall in, they'll get sodden, and they'll drown. They'll get uh, water up their uh, nostrils, and they'll get a uh, type of, um, of lung disease. So um, I was watching one time at uh, um, uh, a crater in Flag near Flagstaff, Arizona, that's called a sunset uh, crater. It's, uh, it's filled in. It's a caldera. And instead of what we have in Oregon, Crater Lake, where the caldera was filled with water, this was a lush mountain meadow down this deep crater um, uh, structure. And with a Navajo uh, standing beside me, I was speaking at the Indian and American I'm sorry, the Indian and Missionary Conference in Flagstaff. It goes back over a hundred years. H.I. Ironside spoke there. And uh, anyway, so it's all American Indian tribes, and it was by this Navajo with our youth group, and he said, use my glasses and watch what's happening. The Basque shepherds were digging a trench along a fast-flowing stream, and he explained to me, they, the sheep can't drink from the fast water. So they dug this long trench. When it was dug, then they connected it to the stream, and it filled up, and then all the sheep appeared, and they can drink the quiet water. God meets our needs in a means whereby we can receive them, uh, his, his gifts. So quiet waters. It's just so touching to think about that. And then we watched, and each shepherd 
ran his, his hands from the muzzle of the sheep to the tail and up and down each leg and on the belly. And he was doing two things there. He was checking for briars and thorns, but he was reminding the sheep that he's the shepherd. And there were hundreds of sheep, and there were a score of, of shepherds, but everyone was touching one sheep at a time. Because if you don't touch the sheep every day, they become feral. And he's talking to the sheep. And, um, and the sheep is, is re, you know, just resilient in all of this. And, and um, it, it's what um, is intended by this word, he refreshes my being. The good shepherd touches the animal every day and talks to the animal every day uh, so that the, the, the bonding remains between sheep and shepherd. And then this ruts of righteousness, he leads me in the ruts of righteousness. I was with a, a, tour group, a student group in, uh, in seminary, from Western Seminary in Israel. We were there the whole summer. And one day we stopped our truck, we didn't have a bus, we were a student group. And we went up a high hill where there was rut after rut after rut, and we waited for a Bedouin shepherd to come along, and then we saw one, and uh, we brought our driver, speaks Arabic, to translate for me, and we stopped him and greeted him in a formal manner, and I asked through the interpreter, could I ask him some questions, and he was very gracious, and he said yes, and I said, why are you on this pathway? Because they were up and down the hillside like fingers across the hills. He says, this is my path. And I said, well, whose path is that? And I don't remember the words, so I'm making this up. That would be Abu Isa. Well, who's, whose path is that? Well, that's Abdul's. But this path, this is my path. It was my father's path. It was his father's path. And as far as our family goes back in time, this was always our path. What would happen if you weren't here? The sheep wouldn't know which path to be on. But my sheep have to be on my path, and the shepherd leads me in his ruts of righteousness, because that's the kind of shepherd he is. Um, in uh, Hebrew Bible, we have a few words that uh, we've gotten more information on than we used to have. And some of this is from Ugaritic, a language that's found in uh, northern Syria near the coast. And um, there's a, a phrase that uh, is so familiar to you, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, that word's always been problematic because we join words together often in Hebrew for names, but not for ordinary things. So tzalmavet would mean shadow of death, but this is, we now believe, many believe, tzalmut, an Ugaritic word, which is an intense form for deepest darkness. Even if I were to walk in a valley that was so dark I could hardly even see. Now for sheep, that's a scary thing. You know, you don't have killer sheep. For a sheep, that's a scary thing. But I'm not afraid. No reason to fear. You, he says to God, are with me. And your implements, rod and staff, they make me comfortable. Uh, imagine that. Here I am, a sheep of God, and I don't have to be afraid in any place I might happen to be. Um, and now, again, exuberant poetry. He pictures the care of the sheep as though the sheep are guests at a banquet table. That's my take. It's hyperbole. I've been treated like that this week. It's like I'm a... Uh, a guy at a, at a banquet, and um, uh, the treatment for me has just been incredible this week. So the spreading of the table, by the way, that's not something on the ground. The, the Hebrew word shulchan is found in Ugaritic to mean a table. It is a table. Some type people tried to change that. But notice, the enemies are still there. They're like a pack of dogs on the rim, and you're down in this verdant valley, and they're licking their chops, but they're not going to lick you because the shepherd is there with you. And in a banquet, it's customary uh, to wipe um, uh, one's uh, forehead. A slave will do that. 
because with olive oil because it's amazingly cooling. We've done that in Israel with student groups, and uh, it's a wonderful thing. Well, here the sheep, the shepherd comes to the sheep and puts oil over the nostrils and the, fa the lower face. Why is that? Because the olive oil keeps um, uh, flies from crawling into the nostrils and laying their eggs and maggots come out and the sheep dies. So the, we watch the shepherds put uh, olive oil on the muzzle, uh, the nostrils of the, of the sheep and come down the face. And, and that shepherding thing is now lifted up to another level. It's as though I'm a guest at a banquet. And then we come to the inn. Uh, oh, my cup is overflowing. That would be a wine cup, of course. But for the sheep, it's water, and there's more water than I can drink. Uh, God's provision is beyond imagination. Now the last. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. Sheep have reason to be concerned about predators, but the predators that are stalking the sheep of God are not wild dogs, but a part of the essential being of God. Chesed. Remember? Van Gogh. <laughs> Chesed. Loyal love. And loyal love is paired with other words from time to time. Chesed ve'emet, that's truth. And the truth and the loyalty aspect of uh, chesed is emphasized by saying in Ahandaya's two words together, chesed ve'emet. That means there's an emphasis on the loyalty aspect. And then this one is tov, goodness and mercy. And, and, the, and the, the tov there emphasizes the love aspect that the love of God is so good. And, and this goes all the days of my life. And on my decease, he is my shepherd still as he brings me to the house of the Lord, the house of Yahweh, in all days to come. The word buy it, house, is used in a variety of ways in the Bible. 2 Samuel 7 plays with that word, and there's seven different meanings for buy it in that one chapter. The house for the sheep is called a sheep coat. And uh, the house of the Lord, ordinarily, you'd think of the temple in Jerusalem, or perhaps um, a temple in heaven. But um, this is the code of Yahweh. It's the house of Yahweh, the house that's designed for sheep. Remember, this is a poet. And he's taking the sheep imagery all the way through to the end. And it's my view that in this psalm, all the days of my life refer to my physical life now. And in the days to come, I will be with him forever. And that's the way this psalm has traditionally been uh, taught and believed and preached. Why is this psalm always uh, often used in, in uh, funerals? But uh, contemporary evangelical scholars, they don't believe this. Here's an example. The translation forever gives a wrong impression, um, at least when the psalm was written in its original Old Testament context. The phrase is really rendered for length of days. That's true. A prolongation of days is the term, lo'orachimim. But then he interprets it, that is, for the duration of the psalmist's life. After all, this very influential evangelical writer says, after all, the teaching about afterlife developed during the late Old Testament period, not until Daniel chapter 12. Now, that's really a loaded statement. This writer does not believe Daniel was written by Daniel. He believes Daniel was written by an imposter 
that it's a pseudepigraphical, pseudepigraphical writing, a false writing, written in the second century B.C. And only in the second century, when German scholars said all the Psalms were written, only in the second century did Jewish people learn about poetry by reading Greek poems. Only in the second century did Jewish, did Jewish people think about heaven by reading Greek poetry and reading about the Elysian fields. Sans, sans de, uh, Elysee in Paris. Imagine this. So that he says, now when you read Psalm 23 in the light of new, the New Testament, even though that's not the idea in the psalm, you can think about heaven, but it's not in the psalm. Uh, and I think that is just so wrong. Here's a commentary written by a Ugaritic scholar uh, when that was new, and he was a pioneer, and it's uh, Dahoud, Mitchell Dahoud, Anchor Bible, three volumes. When this book came out, it was reviewed by uh, Albright, uh, the greatest archaeologist um, uh, of uh, the Western world at the time, William Foxville Albright, Johns Hopkins University. And his review of this book was, um, Dehoud, learning from Ugaritti, has um, contributed more to our understanding of the Psalms than the cumulative history of scholarship in the last 2,000 years. Now, if he put a period there, that would have been an astonishing statement, but he didn't. He put a semicolon. He says, in the cumulative uh, scholarship on the Psalms in the last 2,000 years, semicolon, this assessment will remain correct even when a third of what he said will be proven to be incorrect. <laughs> so if you read selectively, you're going to get good stuff here. But uh, De Hood, uh, in his commentary on this psalm, concludes in this uh, stunning manner. He says, After a peaceful life under the guidance and protection of Yahweh, the psalmist looks forward to eternal happiness in God's celestial abode. And then he says this phrase, days without end, is found in Ugaritic texts and in Phoenician to mean eternity. And... Um, only someone who has a pre-fixed view would deny that. So, uh, I'm using some chutzpah here. I believe David wrote it, and I believe it's a celebration of life. So, a couple of moments of pictures of my wife, and here's the film. Days before Bev's diagnosis, we had commencement in Insukhan. I was one of our, starling, uh, our star graduates that year, in my opinion, such a dear woman and such a brilliant person, and we had no idea what was ahead for us. And I told you yesterday about her strokes, and I'm in the hospital here in, in Portland and wondering if she's going to live. And then her third stroke, we were told she couldn't possibly come home. She'd have to be in a long-term -ter care center for the rest of her life. Uh, a Dallas student, Michelle Philpott, who graduated this May when I took this picture, she made a quilt for Bev. She went on Facebook and she took pictures from my Facebook page and she made this beautiful quilt that was one of the most precious gifts Bev received. She just loved that. And uh, she, every once in a while, we were able to bring Bev home. Here's with our daughter, Loreen, at Christmas. Valentine's Day, I couldn't get her out that year. That was during the height of COVID, but they let me in one of three times that I was able to go see her in 16 months of isolation. It was horrible, and what a great day that was. Uh, when it came time to, to visit her, it was usually through the window. And when she realized that I was going to be able to talk to her, she just couldn't get over it. And she's just, she's mocking my hugging motion through her window. Our anniversary that year was through the window. They had her get dressed. They said, we're going to have a fashion show. They put a beautiful dress and makeup on her. And then they opened the curtain, and there I was sitting outside and our daughters. <laughs> so our anniversary was literally through the window. 
Uh, Thanksgiving 2020, we were able to bring her home, but she had to wear a mask the whole time. Christmas, same thing. She slipped her mask down for the picture. Uh, I'd go walking with her sometimes when they let me in the room and walk down to where the fish were. And this one day she said, let's go, the fish are busy. <laughs> uh, fourth stroke, 16 January, uh, she lost the ability to speak. And um, that was awful. And I taught her how to speak using an Amazon Echo device where she could see, it was a large screen, she could see my mouth, watch my tongue, watch my throat muscles, and um, by uh, uh, two months, she had speech completely back. What a, what a wonderful thing. Uh, home for Memorial Day, um, September, last September, she was doing so well, I asked permission, and uh, my daughter, Rachel, and I, took her to a resort, Seaside, Oregon, for a week. Uh, can you imagine that? She's been locked up in the long-term care center for over two years, and we had her away for a week, and um, had no idea that that would be the only time. But that was so wonderful. Um, a few days, uh, it's, it's almost um, a year now, October 1 is just around the corner. I was in her room. She'd eaten. I took this picture, this selfie of the two of us. Uh, Fifteen minutes later, she collapsed on the bed with another stroke, taken to the hospital. Um, by Tuesday of the second week, things were looking better. She'd lost speech again, and I was working with her. She had ten words, and we thought, uh, we're going to be able to put her into a skilled nursing center and a, the long-term care home again. We'd made all the arrangements. There was a room available. We were so excited. That was Tuesday. Wednesday, when I came in, every day I'd come in, she'd see me, she'd hold her hands up and she'd say, Oh, Ron, you're here again. <laughs> so fun. Wednesday I came in and uh, she held her arms out. But she said, oh, Ron, and that's the last thing she ever said. So Wednesday, we knew she was dying. Tuesday, we were planning on our future. So here she is at home, hospice care, this beautiful blanket. All of our family came, and, uh, we, and dear friends, and uh, lots and lots of hugs. One of my, my oldest friend, we were in nursery together. Our dads were musicians, and our, their wife, our, their, see, my mom and his mom were closest of friends. He has ALS, and he died just a month after visiting Bev. He said, I have to see Bev before I die. And I'm reading the Psalms to her. And... Um, Wednesday morning, I got up at 2, and I'm massaging her. I'm a massage therapist. Her feet were cold, and I knew what was happening. Her hypothalamus was saying, we're not going to keep the feet warm. We've got to keep the core warm. And I knew it would be that day. And uh, that evening, with my son Craig, uh, my daughter Lori, my sister Peggy with a hat, I was holding her. And um, I could, I could, she was patting my neck, and I could feel her heartbeat. And then she stopped patting, and she stopped breathing. And she went from my arms to the arms of Jesus, her shepherd. And I, I look at that, and I think, oh, dear Lord, shepherd me now. Amen.